Hello again and welcome to NEC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NEC TV could be seen on MTS channel 30 or 1030, Westman cable channel 17, Bell satellite channel 592 or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. So this week's edition of the Nipua Banner and Press is dated Friday, June 30th, 2023. There is a huge picture on the front page, a final farewell to NACI's 2023 graduates. It says, graduates of Nipua Area Collegiates Class of 2023 were given their final send-off at the grad ceremony on June 27th. Pictured here, grads look on as the greetings and opening remarks for the ceremony commence. And it says there's some pictures on page seven, which I will show right here, um, right here. Prior to the valedictorian speech at NACI's graduation ceremony, all of the grads were instructed to give themselves a well-deserved pat on the back. And here the valedictorian for the class of 2023 took friends and classmates on a journey through some memories of their years together. But it, it doesn't give her name. And here we have um, a student that's graduating and getting his diploma presented to him. I might as well mention these ones too. This is um, in Gladstone's uh, grad ceremony. Graduates of Gladstone's William Morton Collegiate Institute for 2023 gathered at Williams Park on Friday, June 23rd for their official send-off. Here we have Dean Rosling providing the valedictorian speech. Here we have Marla Jason and Principal Gary Strick. And here we have a graduate named Cameron Debbie with the principal, Gary Strick. So congratulations to all of the new graduates. Sightline obstructions, getting a closer look. Hmm. This is by Owen Devereaux. The line of sight for Nipua motorists trying to turn onto Main Street East could soon get a little bit better. Town Council has decided to examine the visibility for several streets that intersect with the road, which is also known as PTH number five and 16. The reason for the examination is related to a near accident close to Main Street and Fifth Avenue. An individual involved raised a concern with town administration on the sight lines in the area being obstructed due to some trees. Vehicles in that particular spot, as well as a few other locations must drive out an extortionate amount to have a clear perspective on the oncoming traffic. Administration has taken a look at the location and has suggested to Council to further pursue a change. The most likely alteration, if pursued, would be the removal of a few trees along the portion of grass that divides the street from the sidewalk. If removal is approved, it would not be for the entire row of trees, just the ones on the end of the curb strips. Council agreed with the administration's assessment and will have operations do a safety analysis. Long term, Council is also planning to speak with the provincial government on the future development of Highway 5 and 16. Over the past decade, the amount of traffic along the road has considerably increased and the location of Nipua's new health centre will likely compound that rise. The town would like clarification of what plans are being considered. 
Now, you'll have to look at this picture. A funnel cloud sighted east of Arden. A close call reported near Arden on Tuesday, June 27th, as a funnel cloud was seen coming close to touching down, but passed on by, according to reports. Here you can see it right there. There was a number of tornado warnings the last few days on our TVs and our phones, and thank goodness nothing tragic happened. And here we have a picture of our new water slide at the Nipua swimming pool. A major part of the Nipua swimming pool's upgrade has been completed as the new water slide is now open. Here we have Nicole Cooper and Heidi Nugent along with Cohen and Quade Cooper performing the official ribbon cutting or in this case a pool noodle cutting. <laughs> it was on Tuesday June the 28th. The slide is open for the Canada Day weekend. A complete story and additional pictures will appear in the July 7th edition of the Banner and Press. Okay. Now this week, out of Helen Dries out of Helen's Kitchen by Helen Drysdale. This week it's featuring summer kid snacks. Mum hears a lot of can I have a snack all day long, especially in the summer. Those kids are not looking for healthy snacks like carrot sticks. Most prepackaged snacks are filled with sugar and are not the healthiest. Frozen snacks are extremely popular with kids. The frozen snack recipes today are easy to make, taste great, and are more nutritious than the frozen colored sugar water you can buy at the grocery store. So there's a number of them like uh, banana orange popsicles, strawberry pops, apple cinnamon pops, frozen banana treats, fudgy pops, frozen apple wedges, King Kong frozen bananas, and fruit pops. There's a number of, of uh, recipes available if you pick up the Nipois banner and press for those recipes. Now, some news at the Yellowhead Centre by Owen Devereaux. The Yellowhead Centre has received the go-ahead on a bit of a digital transformation. The Nipuan District Centennial Project Committee obtained approval from Town Council on Tuesday, June 20th to proceed with the installation of a new Digital Signage Experience, or DSE. The electronic advertising display will be built close to the main entrance to the Centre's parking lot at Commerce Street. The DSE will be used primarily to promote upcoming events that have been scheduled for both the Yellowhead Arena and the Hall. A hearing on the proposal was held on the 20th of June to allow for public comment either for or against the signage. Jeff Braun, Development Officer for Nipa Wa and Area Planning District, stated that there had been no objections forwarded to him towards the project. Braun noted, however, that his office had received one phone call asking for clarification on the process which was provided. There was no one at the hearing who spoke against the digital signage, while there was one who stepped up in favour. Lindsay Dehalos, the manager of operations for the Yellowhead Centre, spoke to Town Council on behalf of the Centennial Committee. She said, I think this sign is a great opportunity for the Yellowhead to bring more people into the building when they don't know there is a craft sale going on or a Titans hockey game or a minor hockey tournament. Just any event that can be posted would help us a lot, she said. After the hearing was closed, councillors discussed the proposal and came to the consensus that it does fit within the allowable rules already in place. The zoning regulations in place already allows for display of static images at six second intervals without flashing content. Existing electronic signage just down the road near Nipua Area Collegiate Institute was cited as a good example of an informative, not overly intrusive digital sign already in use in the area. With the approval from Council, the Yellowhead Centre can provide with pursuing installation. 
no specific timeline for installation was mentioned at the hearing or council deliberations, though it's expected to proceed in the near future. All right, we have a couple of pages um, with Farmer's Advocate. So I'll read these ones next. Can Facts Canadian Cattle Report by Sean Quebec from Manitoba Agriculture. Reported by CanFax for the week ending June 23rd, Alberta direct cattle sales saw moderate volume cash trade with dressed prices steady to firmer than the previous week from $414 to $415 slash 100 weight delivered. Good demand and manageable supplies fueled a strong $7 slash 100 weight Alberta slash Nebraska cash basis this week. Weighted average Alberta steer prices confirmed around 50 cents slash uh, 100 weight higher than the previous week to $247.84. 84 cents slash 100 weight to be the strongest steer prices seen this week in North America. Western Canadian fed slaughter for the week ending June 17th was 1% larger than the previous week to 38,953 head. Year to date, Western fed slaughter was down 6% from the same week last year totaling 962,141 head. Fed cattle slash cow exports to the U.S. for the week of June 10th were generally steady with the previous week at 6,210 head and were down 18% compared with one year ago. Canadian steer carcass weights dropped below the U.S. weights for the week ending May 20th and as of June 10th, were 11 pounds lighter. Canadian weights had been significantly heavier than the U.S. since September 2022. This contributed to a weak basis in the fourth quarter of 2022 and the first quarter of this year. The shift to more current weights in Canada has supported the basis in recent weeks and led to improved prices. Carcass weights are seasonally the lightest in June, providing the greatest opportunity for feedlots to gain leverage over packers. With most cattle now grazing on pasture, there are fewer cattle sold over the summer months, so many auction marts close over this period. Once cattle are finished grazing in the fall and are rounded up yearlings and calves will be sold through auction, sold direct to a feedlot or be backgrounded at home. Canfax is, project, is projecting prices for fall yearling steers weighing 850 pounds in the $3 to $3.10 per pound range based off of the cattle futures market. The Canadian dollar valued at 76 cents, an average basis ranging from minus 8 to plus 2 cents per pound. The United States Department of Agriculture released its June 1st cattle on feed report and it should be viewed as bearish as feedlot placements came in well above expectations. The marketplace was expecting larger placements of 3.6%, whereas actual placements came in 5% higher. Cattle on feed inventories dropped to 56,000 head from May to June. June 1st cattle on feed inventories totaled 11.6 million head, 2.9% lower than last year and the smallest since 2017. And here we have a spray plane that we see quite often these days. Here is a spray plane swooping low over cropland west of Nipua. The planes are a common sight these days. Manitoba Crop and Weather Report, by, also by Sean Quebec. After a cooler and wettish spring delayed 
seeding initially, hot and dry weather since May 1st has heated and dried out many areas in the province. As of June 11th, according to Manitoba Agriculture's weather stations, all of Agro-Manitoba has over 125% normal corn heat units, with some areas up to 166%. Portage sits at 139%. A lot of Agro-Manitoba has received less than 50% normal precipitation, especially the Interlake, West Lake, and central parts of Manitoba. Some of these areas have seen as little as 9, 25, 31, or 37% of normal precipitation in Lakeland, Austin, Portage, and Gladstone areas respectively. Even though crops were seeded a bit later than desired, warm conditions and long days has aided crop development. With the longest day of the year this week, it is amazing how much crops can progress in one week. Crops have had to root down deeper to find moisture and are doing well considering how dry it has been, but will need rain soon. Earlier seeded spring wheat is starting to head out and early canola will soon be flowering. Perennial forage is like wetter conditions so Hay fields will be, hay yields will be down from last year as a result. Legumes and flowering and grasses are headed out due to the above average heat and haying has begun. Alfalfa weevil can be found defoliating alfalfa plants and is best managed by cutting the forage stand earlier. Early grass growth on pa pastures is sufficient for grazing, but moisture will be needed for regrowth. This will impact the length of the grazing season and whether stocking rates will have to be adjusted down the road. Sean Quebec is a livestock and forage extension specialist based out of Portage La Prairie. You can contact him at Sean spelled S H A W N dot C A B A K at gov.mb.ca or by phone 204-239-3353. And the last one, also by Sean, is entitled Manitoba to Streamline Drainage Compliance. The Manitoba government is responding to feedback from municipalities to help take a coordinated approach on bringing unlicensed drainage works into compliance and achieve best value from the licensing system. The Manitoba government and the Association of Manitoba Mun Municipalities are working together on a legacy drainage licensing project. Additionally, the Manitoba government is encouraging municipalities to bundle connected legacy drainage projects together into one application to provide greater value and encourage a watershed approach to drain maintenance. This approach has a number of benefits, including the following. Coordinating legacy drainage projects on a single license for maintenance purposes. Defraying the cost of the license over multiple projects, providing greater value for money for municipalities and rate bearers. And lastly, encouraging a planned approach to drainage maintenance on a watershed basis. The Manitoba government is also working to enhance drainage compliance across the province, including enhanced resources for enforcement in Budget 2023 and a review of preset fine levels to bring these into line with the new licensing and registration model. Now, on to our sports pages. The first one is entitled WMCI Track Athletes Selected for Dual Province Provincials, submitted by the Nipua Banner and Press. The following track and field athletes from the Nipua and Gladstone slash Langruth area have been selected from the trials held on June 16th and 17th in Winnipeg. Shay Cox, Jillian Parrott, Reagan Tycrobe, Karina 
Kuznikova, Reagan Winters, and Svienna Bjornsson. The girls all tried out by competing in their selected events at the trials. Paul Koshel from Nipua was also selected as the team lead coach and throws coach of both provincial teams this year as well. The girls will be competing in the possible events at under 16 and under 18 dual provincial meet against athletes from Saskatchewan on July the 21st to the 23rd in Regina. Shea Cox will be in the under 16 sprints, relays and triple jump. Jillian Parrott will be in the under 18 middle distance and relays. Reagan Tykrobe will be in the under 16 heptathlon and hurdles. Karina Kuznikov will be in the under 16 heptathlon sprints and relays. Reagan Winters will be in the under 16 javelin, hammer, shot put. And Svienna Bjornsson will be in the under 16 discus and shot put. Congratulations to all the athletes and coaches selected for the dual provincials. And here we have a picture of our own Mark, no, not Mark, <laughs> um, Cam Tibbet. Uh, for the second week in a row, someone has aced a hole in one at the Nipua Golf and Country Club. On June 23rd, Cam Tibbet hit a perfect shot off the tee on the par 3 eighth hole, which found its way to the bottom of the cup. This follows a hole in one on June 20th by Mark Giroux on hole number four. Congratulations for the impressive shots. And here's an article about the Nipua Cubs by Owen Devereaux. It was another week of win some, lose some for the Nipua Cubs, though in a perhaps more unexpected way than usual. The Cubs vanquished the previously unbeaten Plumas Pirates in their midweek game on June 21st by a 6-1 to one score. This highest of highs for Nipua was followed up, however, with a bit of a dud in Minnedosa as the Cubs fell to the first-year Mavericks on Friday, June 23rd by the score of 6-2. to two. The Nipua win versus the Pirates proved to be another pitching masterpiece from Garrett Rempel, who went on a full seven innings for the complete game victory. Editor's note, a Santa Clara League complete game is seven innings, as opposed to the standard nine innings. Rempel allowed just one run on three hits and struck out six. Ryland Dembo was charged with the loss for Plumas, despite a solid effort himself out on the mound. He had six strikeouts as well, and allowed just four hits over five innings. Solid at-bats for Rempel and Cody Pazuisti helped overcome Dembo's effort, though, leading to the Cubs' victory. The Plumas loss dropped the Pirates' regular season record to 8-1. and one. As for Nipua, they were unable to keep their recent momentum going in Minnedosa a few nights later, losing 6-2 to two to the Mavericks. Pitcher Devin Ford ended up collecting the win with a solid five and two-third innings. Luke Guggen came in late for the Mav Mavericks to close out the night with the save. Daniel Lissaway took the loss for Nipua, even though he had a good performance overall with eight strikeouts and just two earned runs. The loss dropped Nipua to four and seven on the season, while this win, along with a doubleheader split versus Portage on June 25th improved Minnedosa to three and nine in the standings. And here on baseball, uh, Nipua wins regionals. There's a picture of a group of boys and their coaches here. A huge weekend out on the diamond for several Nipua minor baseball clubs. First, the 13 and under team pictured here had a perfect four and O record at the baseball Manitoba Midwest Regional Championship. As well, Nipois under 11 baseball club competed in regionals as well. That squad went two and one in their round robin before winning their semifinal in extra innings. They then defeated Rivers eight to seven in the final to advance to the AA Provincial set for Altona 
from June 14th to 16th. Congratulations to both teams on their recent success. And here we have a hockey article about the Nipua Titans by Owen Devereaux. It's a deal that could make the Nipua Titans regular season home opener versus the Portage Terriers a little more interesting. Hmm. On Friday, June 23rd, the Titans announced that they have traded 19-year-old forward Kalen Reynolds and 18-year-old goaltender Gavin Renwick to Portage for a fifth round draft pick and future considerations. Reynolds has spent two seasons in Nipua accumulating 18 points, five goals and 13 assists, playing 56 games with the Titans. He was a fifth round pick in the 2019 MJHL Bantam draft. Renwick, meanwhile, has also spent two seasons in Nipua playing 44 games in net. In his tenure with the Titans, he had 16 wins and 21 losses and a save percentage of 0.863. Reynolds and Renwick will face their former team at the Yellowhead Centre on Saturday, September 23rd. Also with the Titans, they have hired coaching, they have added to their coaching, conditioning and support staff for the next coming year. The Junior A club has agreed to a deal with Bryce Caselny to serve as the team's mental skills and performance coach. In a media release announcing the hire, Titans head coach and general manager Ken Pearson said Caselny joins the club with about 15 years of training and coaching experience. We're pleased to have Bryce join the Titans organization, said Pearson. He will be an excellent resource for our players, assisting them to further develop mental skills that will help them perform at the top of their games. The 2023-24 MJHL season begins for the Titans with training camp, which is scheduled to begin September the 2nd. And the Nipua Tigers Hockey Club supports cancer aid centers. The Nipua Tigers, that's high school, made two donations of funds raised by their cancer fundraising game recently. The top picture, the Titans presented a check of $600 to the Central Plains Cancer Services to help with the mileage costs for the volunteer drivers in the Nipua area. And in this picture, a check of $2,800 was presented to the Nipua chemo unit to cover the cost of a treatment chair. They also purchased, purchased an ice maker for the unit. That's awesome. MCDC to host 2023 Field Day in August by Casper Werhon. The Manitoba Crop Diversification Centre, or MCDC, has an informative day planned. The Carberry-based Agricultural Centre has arranged for its annual field day event to take place on August the 9th. The field day is a time to provide producers with updates on the variety of research projects the MCDC has been conducting. Registration will begin day of at the op off-site at 8.45 a.m. with the event proper starting at 9 a.m. The MCDC off-site is located two miles north of the junction of Highway Number 1 and 5. Signs will also be posted to aid in directing attendees. The first segment of the event features a variety of presentations from speakers Amy Unger, Kayla Moore, Hader Abbas and Vikram Bisht. For this portion, those in attendance will hear about small plot and field scale potato research, an overview of an Assiniboine Delta aquifer groundwater recharge study, the use of mustard as a biofumigant or a natural fumigant for potatoes and herbicide injury in potatoes. <coughs> mustard as a fumigant is one of the MCDC's ongoing projects 
and was also highlighted at the 2022 field day. Many strains of mustard have fumigation properties and can allow for a producer to naturally overcome soil-borne diseases and pests such as Viticulum rhizocotonia, fusarium, pythium, sclerotinia, and common scab. The 22 presentations clarified items such as seeding dates, when the mustard should be incorporated into the soil, and more based on the results available at that time. Additionally, that a variety of strains were being used to determine which would be most effective. These strains included Caliente, Cutlass, Adante, AAC Brown 18, and a male sterile hybrid. Following these presentations, the field day will be moved to the MCDC on site at 10.30 a.m. for the remainder of the event. This second session will have a focus on crop diversification and potato rotational options. Speakers Marla Reichman, Elmer Cascu, Dennis Lang, and Amir Farouk, James Frey, and Shauna McKinnon will provide a soil pit demo, information on farm to market opportunities, TEF grass, greenhouse gas management, and peas protein and profitability. Once all presentations have concluded, all are welcome to enjoy a lunch sponsored by McCain Foods Canada. All right, now we have uh, Ericsson 4-H update by Chet Wolfschiner, the by the Ericsson 4-H Club. The Ericsson 4-H Club Beef, Beef Club has been busy with preparation for the upcoming Achievement Days. Along with the April meeting, a clipping demonstration was held at Wachishan's. Thank you, Jeff and Riley Patterson and Greg Wachishan for all of your knowledge to help on getting our beef projects fit for the ring. On May 8th, the club held a regular meeting night at the Clan William Curling Rink. On May 15th, members and parents from the Erickson, Nipua and Rapid City Clubs got together at Clanman, Jersey to bag the joint order of over 400 bags of compost, 12,000 pounds of compost was bagged. The club would like to thank everyone who supported this year's Nipua and Area Fat Stock Show Compost Rate Fundraiser. A big thank you to Clanman, Jersey for once again partnering with us on this fundraiser. On Sunday, June 11th, the club had a wind-up barbecue and field day along with the June meeting. We brushed up on our showmanship skills and made halters and neckties. Thank you to the Pattersons for hosting. Our club level achievement day was held at the Minidosa Egg Barn on Sunday, June 25th. The Nipua and Area Fat Stock Show and Sale Day is Wednesday, July the 5th. Steer sale is at 7 p.m. The event is open to the public to take in. We welcome everyone to come out and watch us show off this year's projects. An amazing adventure in Nipua celebrates RCMP's 150th anniversary. Submitted by Spruce Plains RCMP. On June 24th, as part of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police 150 anniversary celebrations, the Nipua RCMP hosted an amazing adventure with grades five to seven students from Nipua, followed up with a barbecue for the contestants and their families. The event kicked off with everyone meeting in the Nipua Riverbend Park for some opening remarks and a brief history of the RCMP's 150 years of service in Canada. The adventure took place around seven waypoints in the community of Nipua and spanned a distance of approximately 3.5 kilometers. Contestants along with an adult guide took part by walking, biking and for some in a vehicle. At each waypoint the contestant was greeted by a member of the RCMP where they were given clues containing information on 
the RCMP and guiding them to various iconic town landmarks where they would receive their next clue. At two of the waypoints, contestants were challenged with some games such as beanbag, beanbag toss and ladder ball to earn extra chances to win one of the prizes. There were more than 50 youth registered to take part in the activities. After the contest was over, the RCMP officers, contestants and their families all gathered for barbecue and to draw the prizes. In the end, 12 lucky contestants won prizes that included a PlayStation 5, Apple iPad and 10 gaming gift cards. The weather was perfect for the event and there were many positive comments from the attendees that this event made for a really great day to spend with their family and friends and a very positive experience. And there's a couple of pictures here. Um, members of the Nipua RCMP holding this amazing adventure on Saturday, June the 24th. These look like, like some of the winners. And here they're providing clues at multiple check stops to the 50 youth who participated in the day. And here we have a picture of um, some kids at a picnic table. Uh, the Rhythm Cycle Club in Nipua teamed up with Dream Ride organizers Gary and Marsha Forg to host a barbecue and spin-a-thon on June the 25th. The barbecue was hosted on the parking lot of the old co-op building. Cyclists took part in charity sessions which took place inside the club, which is located inside. Full details will appear in a future edition of the Nipua Banner and Press. So we'll go back to a page I didn't get to. Let's see, let's read Home Bodies by Rita Friesen. This week her, it's, uh, her feature is entitled Rascally Rabbits. The long-eared fluff balls were rather cute this spring. The one morning I watched four of them play a lively game of ring around the house across the street. I had noticed more of them in the area than last year, and I was led to believe that this is a natural progression for the species. Last summer, one would sit on the driveway chewing away at the growth between the cracks in the concrete, never even glancing at my pea patch right beside it. Not this year. I was fussing about the slow growth of my peas and corn. I had planted them early, watered them well, and the majority of the pea plants remained under six inches tall, with only the occasional one making its way to the top of the fence. Then one morning, looking out the window, I spotted two long gray ears protruding above the peas. <laughs> Tucked in between two rows, there sat the culprit just chowing down. Opening the garage door did not deter him. Approaching him and quietly asking him or her to leave did not disturb the creature. When I chased it away, it crossed the road, sat at the edge of the neighbor's yard and looked at me. That cheeky rascal. If I thought a dismissal from the garden would be enough, I was sadly wrong. If I didn't spot the rabbit nibbling, I saw the evidence. So I patched up a fence. I had some rebar in the garage some remnants of chicken wire and got the west half, the approach side fenced in. That left the east side open to attack. So I cobbled together sturdy cardboard and more rebar. That evening, the gray intruder approached from the west, paused in be bewilderment, proceeded down the south side only to find all avenues blocked. It pondered a moment after tasting the corn, but it was bigger and tougher than it was a few weeks ago. And along with my kai yipping, it am ambled across the lawn to the neighbors. I may have won this round. One rabbit, two rabbits, stories and cartoons about rabbits. It got me thinking of the hours we watched Bugs Bunny, the ingenious never die bunny that entertained countless kids and adults. 
He introduced me to Elmer Fudd, the Roadrunner, Wiley e. Coyote, and a host of side characters. None of those cartoons ever made me think I could walk under an anvil and come away unscathed or detonate dynamite without serious repercussions. The other rabbit tucked into my memory bank is the Peter Rabbit and his feud with Mr. McGregor. My younger son loved that book, preferred reading every night. The miracle of little Peter finding his way safely back home was always a miracle. Then one summer my father rented Hayland from a gentleman in the area. I was living at home with my children at the time and so we were included in the conversation. Noticing tears quietly trickling down my son's cheek, we asked what was the matter. Well, the hay field belonged to Mr. McGregor and therefore was a dangerous place for all of us. We assured him we weren't rabbits and so not in any danger. Dreams Worth Working and Praying For Part 3 by Neil Strohshine faithfully yours. As I have made my way through this thing called life, I have noticed a subtle change in our use of some English words. This week's example is the word entitlement. For most of my life, I have understood that word to mean that those who put in the required amount of time and effort are entitled to the legitimate rewards for their actions. So, for example, you are entitled to a full day's pay for a full day's work. After a full season of planting, nourishing, and protecting crops, a farmer is entitled to a fair market price for the products that have been harvested and stored. A home gardener is entitled to enjoy eating the fresh vegetables that have been growing, do, growing during the summer months and the preserves that have been prepared and stored for winter. The same principle applies to our financial investments. Workers who contribute to company pension plans are entitled to receive the benefits from those plans when they retire. Those who purchase health or life insurance are entitled to receive payments from those policies when they are required. So are those who pay into government plans like the Canada Pension Plan and others. There is nothing wrong with calling these things entitlements. You have invested time, talent and treasure in these things. You are entitled to the legitimate rewards of your investment. But in recent years, we have been hearing about an entitlement mentality that some people display. An article I found on the WebMD website defines it this way. The entitlement mentality has been defined as a sense of deservingness or being owed a favor when little or nothing has been done to deserve special treatment. It's the you owe me attitude. Simply put, people with an entitlement mentality think that the rules don't apply to them. If that definition sounds a little scary, it should, because it is. I will never forget my first exposure to this attitude. It came from a comment made by a worker whose union was about to begin negotiations with government agencies for a new contract. The comment went something like this. We helped elect the government currently in power. They had better come through for us. Many decades have passed since I heard those words, but I still feel their sting whenever I think of them. I have a simple message for every reader of this column. Every cent of every dollar we have ever received was taken from someone else so that we could receive it. Some of the funds were given willingly in payment for goods and services we helped provide. The rest were given grudgingly in taxes and user fees paid to various levels of government who then gave some of them back to us in services and other benefits. But as St. James reminds us, the ultimate source of all these things is God himself. Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father who is the source of all light. 
James 1, verses 17. Everything, including the lives we live and the air we breathe, is God's gift to us. It is a favor that we do not deserve. It is time we replace the you owe me attitude with an attitude of gratitude to God for all the things we have received and for those God used to get them to us. Does this sound impossible? Perhaps, but I believe it's a dream worth working and praying for. I'll read the thumbs up, thumbs down section. There's two thumbs up this week. Huge thumbs up to Angela Hutton and the Hutton family for making youth soccer happen in Nipua. Thanks for all the hard work organizing and executing a fun and accessible activity for all Nipua youth. From Kate Jack Jackman Atkinson of Nipua, Manitoba. Also, thumbs up to the Nipua Lions Club for letting us use the Pioneer School down at Riverbend Park to teach our students about life in pioneer times. The kids had a lot of fun from the grade two teachers at HMA school, HMK school from Nipua, Manitoba. Oh, and here's another little article about graduation. Sprucewood Colony had some grads this year. The following names are graduates of the Sprucewood Colony for 2023. Aaliyah Hoffer, Lauren Hoffer, Michaela Hoffer, Dorian Waldner, Jessica Waldner, Naomi Waldner, Timothy Woolman, and Joseph Woolman. Congratulations. All right, so now we have a message for every community by Ken Waddell, right in the center. First, a disclaimer. The views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the banner and press staff. As summer holidays emerge on the scene, I have a favor to ask of every reader. I am especially asking that over the summer, people aged 25 to 45 years of age contemplate the future of their respective communities. Summer is filled with great community activities. There are fairs, picnics, sports days, family and school reunions, an endless list of things to do. I want the 25 to 45 year olds to think about all the events and the facilities in which they are held. Think about the parks, the skating and curling rinks, the community halls, the sports fields and pools in our communities. Think about how they got built the thousands upon thousands of volunteer hours that put them in place and the volunteer time and money for upkeep and improvements. All these events, facilities and groups didn't happen by magic. They didn't simply appear out of thin air. They all came about by hard work and mostly by the efforts of volunteers. After you think about all these things, I can almost guarantee you will conclude somebody should take up these causes. And you are absolutely correct. What you may not conclude is that the someone is you. I could safely say that every community is similar, but I will use an example from Nipua simply because that is the history I know best. I will use one example, and that is Nipua's Yellowhead Center, a hall and arena combination unit. The Yellowhead Center is made up of parts of the old salt well and some new construction. In the 1960s, the salt well shut down. The short version of, of the story is that the town of Nipua turned it over to the Nipua Centennial Project, Inc. A committee was formed, money raised, and the facility opened 50 years ago. That community center, like many other such facilities in many other communities, is a cornerstone of the community. The underlying message is that some of the people who worked their fingers to the bone to make the Yellowhead what it is today are still alive and quite active. That means that they were 25 to 30 years old or so back in the day. A big thank you goes out to them and to the young people who have stepped up over the years to do the community work. The problem is that there aren't enough young people realizing there is work to be done 
facilities and organizations cannot run only on 70 to 80 year old people. There has to be new troops. If you want a community to at least be as healthy as the one you grew up in, then your community needs you. You are badly needed. Many times I have heard from younger people, well, I have to work or I have to raise my kids. Well, that's true, but what did you think all those now old people did 50 years ago? They worked and raised kids and when there was a fundraising supper to put on, they didn't always buy the food, they often donated it. As I look across the readership area, every town needs more volunteers, less infighting, more cooperation and a swell of improvements. As my generation starts to age out, I was 20, uh, 75 years old this year, the torch has to pass on and simply standing by is not an option if you want your community to be as good or better than the one you were raised in. There are some tremendous young leaders in our communities. Many are being taught volunteerism in school and in the community. They need encouragement, they need more helpers, and they need to move forward. If the old guard doesn't get renewed, our community facilities and organizations will die with the passing of our older people. That would be a shame to their memory and a huge loss to our communities. No doubt our communities will survive, but they can thrive. And it is a fresh generation of volunteers who will make that reachable. Now, the last thing I will read is, hmm, where is it? Oh, it is. It's called Looking Back. There's only four or five little articles on this page. It's kind of interesting sometimes. Oh, and also the, the Roxy Theatre. Um, the next show is called Book Club. The next chapter follows the new journey as, of four best friends as they take their book club to Italy for the fun girls trip they never had. Parental Guidance, July 5th and 6th, showtime 7.30 p.m. And then the one after that is July 12th and 13th, 7.30 p.m., it's called Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. <clears throat> so, 125 years ago in Nipua, 18, June 30th, 1898. This should be interesting. It has been brought to the attention of the press that a pet dog, lately deceased and sorely lamented by the owner, was interred in the Nipua Cemetery and we are asked to draw public attention to the matter for the purpose of determining the important point whether such an act is permissible. <laughs> if the owner of a, a cemetery plot is at liberty to bury other than human being therein, the practice of interring pets of various species may become too general. <clears throat> Persons who have deposited the remains of loved ones in the cemetery Consider it a desecration of that sacred place to bury any dumb animal therein, be the same ever so dear a family pet. Without any pretension of being facetious, the press considered this a grave question <laughs> that should be inquired into and decided at once. <clears throat> oh my goodness. Now that this is also in 125 years ago, now that Nipua has won the district football championship for northwestern Manitoba, our next ambition is to capture the provincial championship. The present team, strengthened by Wes Hewitt and C. St. John, who are now in Ontario with the Carberry team, would be likely winners against any team in the province. Now, a hundred years ago, June 29, 1923, in Franklin, we learn from unofficial sources of the resignation of Mrs. Taylor and Simpson from the local teaching staff. Both during their engagement here have served the school board faithfully and well. Whilst regretting their de departure, we wish them success in their endeavors elsewhere. Also a hundred years ago, manager Brooker will close the opera house tomorrow night after managing it for the past 
11 years, but he is glad to say he is not leaving town having secured Andrew Mitchell's confectionery store, which he will take over on Monday, July 9th, and he intends to run the store on the standard of service and satisfaction. 75 years ago, 1948, the Women's Institute of Arden are compiling a scrapbook of the early history of the district and are desiring to get a list of the early history settlers who came up until the near 1890. Hmm. 50 years ago, congratulations to the Calwood Collegiate team on capturing the championship spot in the Parkland Regional Zone playoffs held in McCreary Saturday, June 6. Nipuan District Branch of the Manitoba Teachers Society honoured retiring teachers at their regular meeting by presenting them with life memberships to the society. 20 years ago, and here's the last one, the Nipua Spring Hill Farms hog processing plant will reduce its workforce by more than one half, putting 160 people out of work. The, uh, the layoffs followed a tumultuous week in which the Nipua plant was pressured by a lockout of workers at Winnipeg's Warman Road Maple Leaf plant, where Spring Hill's product is shipped and falling hog prices. Also, the Glenella Fire Department held their annual Horse Derby Ride, June 21st and 22nd. A short ride was held on Saturday with the live band called Bull Ruckus playing for the evening. <laughs> well, that does it for this week's edition of the Nipua Banner and Press. Thank you for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next time. So bye for now. <laughs>